a brief overview of the capacity that they're looking at. And um, as you see, the top two are an extremely large number of coal per year. And the total capacity would be around 150 million tons per year. Um, and a study by Western Organization Resource Councils uh, said that uh, export market of 140 million tons would mean 60 unit trains per day traveling to and from the Powder River Basin and the coal export terminals. Um, and with that comes... I'm sorry, can you find yeah. one of 60, uh, 60 unit trains? Oh yeah, 60 unit trains, that means one coal train, 125 coal cars, and that's one unit. So 125 coal cars is one unit, and there's going to be 60 of those, um, or 30 full and 30 empty per day going through our backyards and our neighborhoods. Um, and obviously with that many coal trains coming through, there's going to be uh, numerous effects on health and the climate and so forth. And John, should we jump into that? All right, yeah. So I guess I'm going to be talking about the effects of coal exports. And uh, it's going to be coming from an increased uh, mining in eastern Montana, specifically Otter Creek, which Nick will be talking about in uh, in the future of this presentation. And it, it's going to heavily affect the ranching livelihood. Uh, the coal trains are going through a lot of ranch land, and there is a, uh, a huge impact of coal dust, which could be spread along the ranch lands. Um, and then also, coal dust impacts local health. Um, just in Missoula, I'll be getting to a picture in the future of them cleaning up. Uh, they, they couple the cars in Missoula, and that puts a lot of coal dust in the air. And we have a lot of statistics that show uh, um, links to lung disease and cancer and stuff like that through coal dust. Uh, you know, it hurts our air quality, obviously, through coal dust and also diesel emissions of these trains. Um, in Missoula specifically, they sit in Missoula and just like run their trains, spewing the diesel in the air. And then noise pollution, uh, which I believe Lowell will touch on in the future. Um, and then in, uh, it's an environmental injustice and it obviously is going to increase our climate change um, because sending it to China is not going to stop. Climate change. Uh, not, have a with anyway? We do have a huge problem with inversions and I believe we might have taken it out of this slide, um, but we barely meet the um, 2.5 particulate matter yeah. and we don't meet the 10 particulate matter. And this is a port. Uh, in BC, and if you, yeah, you can see that's all coal dust in the air um, from like dumping the coal into the cargo things. Um, and uh, talking more about coal dust, there's lead, mercury, chromium, uranium, all this stuff in coal dust, which is really bad for the lungs and everything like that. Uh, compute, uh, pollutes communities and waterways, um, and 40 to 50 percent of train service workers develop a lung disease um, from working. Uh, within this atmosphere, um, and it poses a high risk of cancer, obviously. And then this is the picture that I was talking about. Uh, this is a little cleaning uh, tractor thing, um, and I, I heard got news from a friend that they might have uh, spilled some coal. Um, you can see further down, there's a lot of a lot of dirt, black, black, possibly coal. Um, and Nick actually went. Uh, to one of our railroad crossings and found coal in the railroad crossing. And so this, our, our north side is directly to, on the right of that picture, the north side, and there's you can see the houses, and that's going directly to those houses. Um, and it's really just not good, and that, would, that could potentially happen all along the train tracks. Is that just uh, from transit? Uh, that's from a lot of coupling, I uh, assume. Uh, but it is also from transit. The, the cars actually lose most of their coal dust in the bottom. A lot of people are saying, oh, just cover the cars because that will stop the loss of coal dust. But it's actually not true. They lose most of it from the bottom. And that can also increase yeah. the likelihood of derailment. So a, lot of the, a lot of the coal cars are bottom unloaders. So when they, the empty ones come through town, they have carry back within them. There's still very small fugitive coal that's still in the bottom of those coal cars. And they come through Missoula and they couple. And when they do that, they're essentially, they have one engine, or one engine on this side, another on this side, and they're banging coal cars together because they're building the train right there. Yeah. And when they're doing that, it's dropping coal dust out the bottom, it's throwing coal dust up in the air. And 
Um, I live on the north side, and this is a picture of my, my windowsill. And as you can see, it's black with what seems to be coal dust in my mind. Um, I don't know what else is black and has, I don't know, you know, I live right by the track, so it, it makes sense to me. Um, Burlington Northern estimates 500 pounds. Right, Burlington coal. Northern, 500 pounds in per, tra yes. per car in transit. And then the Whatcom Docks, um, which is a group, a group of like, I think 220 plus physicians, and they said that it's one pound per mile per car that's of coal that is lost. Um, and then I just have a really short clip. This is just off my balcony at my house. Um, let's see if I can, uh, I don't know if I'm gonna get, get it to play or not, but I live right, the tracks are right over there, and then this is just kind of a maintenance area and fueling station, and it's right in front of my house. And um, this morning, I woke up, looked outside, and I saw this train just sitting there, spewing out so much diesel, and it went on for 10 minutes doing this. Um, and the fumes were just being carried by the Hellgate winds into the north side neighborhood. Um, and with more, with 60 coal trains coming through, there's going to be more maintenance and more fueling and more diesel engine idling. Diesel um, particulates are just as problematic as coal. Right, They're exactly. Really and causing disease. Exactly. And diesel particulates are really abrasive. So heavy met metals have a tendency to latch onto those particulates. So you're not only breathing the diesel, the arsenic, and other bad things about diesel particulate, but the combination of coal and diesel, you're getting those heavy metals. So it's terrible. It's just really bad for your uh, for public health in general. Um, and the noise pollution, as I kind of touched on, is really loud with these empty trains. They produce uh, decibel levels of up to 119 um, decibels, which is extremely loud. It actually shakes my house and rattles my plates on my shelves. Um, Especially for wildlife and uh, epileptic. Right. Yeah, and speaking of wildlife, uh, we have a wilderness uh, uh, literally like eight miles from my house, and we have a recreation area like a mile from my place. And if I'm like five miles up there, six miles up there, I can still hear the trains while I'm in the wilderness going on hikes or whatever. Yeah, definitely. It's really. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, and yeah. so obviously the, the climate change impacts are going to be huge. Um, these are a couple of quotes from the first one is Nobel laureate Steve Running. He's a professor at the university here. He's a climate scientist, and uh, he he said this in word for word: uh, sending coal to Asia is actually worse for the climate because it adds emissions from transportation, and the coal is still burned in overseas power plants. And there's also estimates that that coal that is burned in China is going to be back in our atmosphere in the United States within what two to three weeks, depending on how fast they burn it and everything like that. And it's the way they burn it also, mm -hmm. because it makes the particular like way worse than... They don't have the scrubbers or anything. Yeah. Yep. And actually in the United States, we don't have all of our plants don't have scrubbers either, which is weird. No, they're so grandfathered in. Yeah, exactly. Um, and then the second one is James Hansen. He's a NASA scientist, I'm sure most of you have heard of him. Uh, and his quote says, the first thing we need to do is to mitigate climate change. To mitigate climate change is to stop burning coal because coal is the biggest contribu contributor to carbon dioxide in, in our atmosphere. Um, and this uh, is just a little statistic. Um, the two biggest uh, problem problems posed to climate change are the coal exports and the XL oil pipeline. And they're both, as you can see, very big. And on the side, it's uh, millions of tons of CO2 burned per year that will be put into the atmosphere. Um. Sure, yeah. So, um, so Brian and Lola have talked about kind of the impacts of transporting this coal and um, impacts on those neighborhoods. But of course, in Montana, we're also dealing with the impacts of coal mining. Um, and that is threatening to get a lot worse as these proposals move forward to export more coal. Because right now, there is coal mining in Montana. But it's actually, it's 
there's a lot less of it than in um, Wyoming, just to the south, and there's a lot less than um, there could be because. Uh, so, so today, uh, Wyoming is the number one, by far the number one producer of coal in the United States. But Montana actually has much larger coal reserves underground than Wyoming does. It's just that most of them <laughs> haven't been tapped yet, and we want to keep it that way. Because if those ever were tapped, we would have, it, it, it would be worse than Wyoming. And Wyoming is having problems enough with mining already. Um, some of the specific problems that this uh, would cause in eastern Montana, where the mines would be located if it happened, is um, one, one of the most severe is it depletes and pollutes water out in that part of the state. And this is a very dry part of the state, so water is a scarce, precious resource, and there's a lot of farmers and ranchers who are very upset about this possibility of mines coming in and using up the precious water. Also, because it's so dry, it takes a very long time for the land to regenerate. Um, Montana actually has a state law that says that all uh, lands that are used for coal mining are supposed to be restored to their original state but only about 2% of the lands that have been, yeah, less than 2% have been restored to anything close to the original state. It just, it just can't be done in that kind of dry climate. Um, so the, the, the mine that um, is kind of moving, um, has, has moved the uh, furthest along and that we're focusing a lot of our energy on in Montana is this Otter Creek mine. Um, it's, it's, in the, it's in the Powder River Basin uh, on the Montana side of the border, the Powder River Basin extends into both Montana and Wyoming. And it's kind of this anchor project in this much larger plan to transform the northern Powder River Basin into an industrial coal zone. Um, parts of the Powder River Basin in Wyoming already are that, an industrial coal zone. But um, partly uh, the, the reason why it's so important um, is um, if, if coal companies are allowed to build this Otter Creek mine, that's going to give them the justification for building this railroad called the Tongue River Railroad, which would go from around the Montana-Wyoming border up to um, this place called Miles City, where it connects with the existing rail line that eventually comes through Missoula, Spokane, all of those places. Once they get that railroad in place, this is going to open up uh, the possibility of, uh, of new mines in vast areas beyond just the Otter Creek mine itself because they'll have a way to transport that coal to the market, which right now that's part of the reason why this coal has stayed underground so long, is because there isn't really an economically feasible way to transport a lot of it to the market. The Tongue River Railroad would give the coal companies that and Otter Creek would allow them to build or make it easier for them to build the Tongue River Railroad. So um, one of the other unusual things about, kind of unusual things about the Otter Creek Mine is it is actually located on state lands in Montana rather than federal lands or private lands, which is what a lot of the other um, coal mines are located on. And the, um, the, the people who are <laughs> officially have control over what happens with these state lands are the members of Montana State Land for um, these five folks up here. And in 2010, um, these folks voted three to two to give um, a preliminary lease to Arch Coal to start moving forward on the application process to mine in Otter Creek. You can see um, it was it was a close vote. You can see the three who um, voted for Otter Creek. So those are the ones voting the way we do not want, and the two who um, voted against it. Um, and yeah. Yes, Bullock is running for governor, and he is, he's a he's an interesting one because he did vote against that Otter Creek lease, which is good, but he also sometimes he, he he can go either way on coal, so we're not really sure what's going on with him in his uh, position. Is kind of surprising to come down on that side? Schweitzer actually is he's he's one of the most uh, he's he's the most pro coal member of the land. Yeah, he's. All about He's actually like government. campaigned in Longview, Washington, for the coal export terminal. Yeah, he, he went out to Longview to do that. So, fortunately, he's not going to be governor much longer. He's term limited out. <laughs> well, it could be worse. I mean, or at least it could be just as bad as that. Worse yeah, than yeah. Who knows what the elections will be? That's that's a that's a whole other story. <laughs> um, now, when this uh, when the land board. Uh, Gave this lease in 2010. There was a, a lot, of, a lot of um, protest over that. Um, Northern Rockies Rights of Kai did a great job protesting that. They actually uh, disrupted the landlord meeting where they gave the lease and were able to delay them 
um, from actually giving the lease out for at least an hour or so. There's a picture of that there. And actually, um, as, as far as we know, the uh, largest high school student walkout to protest any climate issue occurred in uh, Missoula, Montana, where high school students were protesting um, the, this lease. And that's, and it's, it's, that's really especially uh, interesting because one of the coal company's big arguments is they say that um, this coal is on state lands, and if you open it up, it'll give money to schools. Well, the students who actually go to those schools are protesting the, the lease. Uh, that doesn't really make sense. Um, the good news is um, the land board still has authority to block uh, mining at Otter Creek, um, which is something that not everybody realizes who's familiar with this story. There's kind of this misconception that that 2010 lease was the final decision. It was not. The article has more permits they need to get. Um, but it's very clear that those three who voted for the lease are going to continue to side with Arch unless we really, unless we ramp up the pressure in a big way. And so that's what many of us in Montana are trying to do this summer, um, building on that history of uh, direct action that you saw in the last, um, the last photo. We are planning a um, prolonged uh, direct action at the Capitol building from August 13th through 20th. This is the Montana Capitol in Helena. We will be um, doing a sit-in in the building, with, and we're hoping that we're actually going to have hundreds of people participating in that over the um, course of the action. We already have um, over 100 who have signed up. Did I mention the rally? August 13th to the 20th. Yes, August Yeah, 13th through the 20th. And there will be two, um, for those who aren't quite uh, ready to uh, risk arrest participating in the sit-in, on the 13th we're going to have um, a big rally as well in support of those who are starting to sit in that day, and that'll be, and there, and also throughout the week, there will be ways for folks who don't want it. Sierra Club in, endorse that. Or it's going to be. They'll be part of that rally. <laughs> yeah, in, in some way they'll be. Not the not not the vi uh, nonviolent direct action, but the rally. Yeah. <laughs> we didn't want to exclude them. <laughs> yeah, and so yeah, so these are the details. Um, rally on the 13th, sit in at the Capitol throughout those eight days. Um, we are going to have nonviolent direct action trainings um, every evening before the sit-in is occurring, so that everyone who's participating can go through um, can go through a training. Um, lodging, we actually have um, we're able to provide lodging for people who want to participate in this at a, a local church. They've offered up their space, so it won't be fancy, but that will be available. And we're going to be working on coordinating um, carpools and stuff. Oh, and then I almost forgot to mention the reason why the, the timing for this August 13th through the 20th. Um, on August 20th, the land board is having a public meeting. So we're planning this in the week leading up to that. And then on the 20th itself, we will be able to go in that, um, having done a full week of a sit-in in the Capitol and demand that they stop uh, siding with Arch Bull on this. Um, the goal is to bring a thousand people to Helena. It's, it's an ambitious goal, but that's I think we can make it. And uh, yeah, if anyone's interested in <laughs> coming out, we'd love to have you. Um, I think most people got those little uh, quarter sheets, but if not, I've got them up here. This has the um, web address for more information about the action. And um, yeah, just kind of wanted to uh, close with one now that um, this is, as many of you know, this fight against coal exports is something that extends throughout the Northwest, and there are already communities um, all over this region organizing against it. Um, these are just a tiny sampling of, the, of various actions that have happened in various parts of the Northwest opposing coal exports. And so this is a really vibrant movement that's picking up a lot of momentum, and I think we're going to win. <laughs> <laughs> questions for these folks. I was going to give a little bit from the Portland Northwest view. Do you want, does have any burning questions right now for these fellas? I'm just kind of curious. I live a block away from the railroad downtown. Yeah. Um, I assume that puts me at great risk for all this stuff. Yeah, definitely. Um, what sort of stories can I bring up? Uh, I'd love to be able to tell the story, Yeah. but I just need the information. Right. So um, where can I get it? Yeah. Well, there's a great website. It's called coaltrainfacts.org, and that has a lot of information on um, the pollution that comes with coal trains. Um, I'll put up some of those yeah. YouTube videos um, on the uh, about the coal trains and the 
events for this. Mm -hmm. So people can look at them as well. Okay. Would you send me a link to them? So I think it is really important that we are here in Spokane because regardless of which terminals get built first or where where they end up, um, it's, all of them are coming through Spokane. Um, so resistance here is incredibly important. Uh, I wanted to talk briefly, touch on another route for transporting coal, which is the Columbia River itself, the barging issue. This is um, being posed by Amber Energy uh, as sort of the greener option, uh, and we're supposed to be very happy with this, um, but we're of course not. Their plan uh, is still to bring trains through, um, through Spokane, and then to offload the trains in the eastern Oregon town of Boardman, Oregon, which is our only coal-fired power plant slated to close in 2020, uh, onto barges and bring them down the Columbia River, where then they will put them onto Panamax vessels and ship them overseas. So this is another issue that we're also fighting. Um, they're planning to, they put a contract out to, to some local companies in the Northwest to build these covered barges. So this is how they're discrediting our concerns about coal dust, um, which is why we really, uh, it's super important to focus, like these guys are doing, on keeping the coal in the ground. Like this is our, this is what we really want. It's not just that we want covered trains. We don't want covered trains. We don't want coal at all. Um, so that we don't use the coal here, do we? No, all of this, all of these are export proposals. Yeah. Um, both Oregon and Washington are closing their coal-fired power plants within the next 12 years. Um, no, we wouldn't use them. Yeah. Yeah. We, we have three trades a week to supply some trailers. Right? Mm -hmm. um, so the barging issue, yeah, it's, it's raised huge concerns, especially from the tribes along the Columbia River Gorge, because this is, these are impacting their, their treaty fishing areas, um, which is incredibly significant. I've lived in the Columbia River uh, in the gorge, and it's such a livelihood. Uh, and you're looking at between 500 and 1,200 barges a year um, that would come through as a, as a result of the barging project. So as you're talking about it, uh, there are, the companies are trying to think of other ways to sneak coal out of the Northwest, so we want to just make sure we cover all of them. Um, right now, what's happening sort of at the state levels um, is we're calling for what's called a Programmatic Environmental Impact Statement, P-E-I-S. Uh, and basically what that is, it's a request to the Army Corps of Engineers to say, um, basically saying, you cannot just look at Longview, you cannot just look at Bellingham, you cannot just look at St. Helens or Coos Bay as isolated projects. These are six projects that are identical in what they're trying to do, that are identical in the harm that they're trying to cause, um, that they will bring to our communities, and you have to look at all of them together. So we're actually hoping, or we're actually predicting um, that a decision about this programmatic environmental impact statement will come out sometime in September. Uh, so that could be something pretty significant in slowing down a lot of the projects. Right now the project that's furthest along is the barging project actually. They have um, um, Amber Energy applied for a, it's a fill permit. It's quite insignificant except when you think of it as it's a fill permit to build a dock that's a coal dock. So it received 17,000 comments in opposition. Um, don't quote me on this, but I doubt there are very many docks that get 17,000 uh, comments in opposition every day. So it's pretty significant, and we're hoping that that project, that that comment period gets opened up again, uh, asking the, the Army Corps of Engineers to reconsider that as well. So that's kind of where we are. Um, and also, it's potentially the Bellingham project will open up for scoping this summer as well, which is the pre pre-environmental impact uh, statement phase. So things are moving, like, uh, the coal companies are definitely getting their foot in the door, and it is up to us to do everything we can to stop them, to raise the level of controversy, um, to talk to, the, to our neighbors, you know, organize up and down the routes. And in fact, the mayor of Cheney, I say this right? Yes. Okay, Cheney, uh, has been a pretty vocal, 
um, opposer, like opponent of the export issue because of the trains. So if folks are looking for local inspiration, I refer you there. Um, in Portland, we are, uh, we would see up to 12 trains a day going to the St. Helens and, um, and Coos Bay terminals. Coos Bay is on the coast, St. Helens is on the Columbia River. Um, these trains are going through North Portland. For us, it's a huge uh, environmental justice issue because North Portland has um, asthma rates um, three times what the rest of Portland has because of these, because of the train yards. Um, so there's been we're doing a lot of work in those North Portland neighborhoods because they're the ones who are seeing it. It's also you know where the highest concentration of low-income folks live, the highest concentration of minority populations in all of Oregon live in this area that are right around the rail tracks. Uh, so it's really important that we we can focus on this not just as an environmental issue solely, but it's an environmental justice issue because it's who lives near the tracks. It's people who can't afford to live farther farther away from the tracks, basically. Um, and just some really interesting things from from Oregon as well. A few weeks ago, PG&E, which is the electricity the electricity company that runs our Boardman, our only coal-fired power plant, um, rejected uh, one of the coal terminal, one of the coal companies' proposals for a lease on their land for coal. Um, so Kinder Morgan is one of the companies that would bring coal trains through Portland, and they um, wanted to lease land from PG&E for their terminal. PG&E knows coal. They're they put coal on our grid, they have a coal-fired power plant, and they actually uh, would not give the lease to Kinder Morgan. So this is just you know, a really interesting thing that you're saying, like, people who know coal don't want coal as their neighbors, so why should the rest of us have to deal with it? Um, you know, pg and &E has the option of saying, no, you can't build here, but we also need to step up and say, we also have the option of saying, no, you can't build here. Um, they were protecting, they listed as their concern, um, coal dust getting into their natural gas intake facility. So they're concerned about coal dust as well. It's kind of an interesting thing. Um, and I also want to put out there that, you know, these companies are, they're not as big and strong as we think they are. Uh, they have weaknesses. Um, they have people in our communities that support them. The, in Portland, for example, the coal company um, Amber Energy is contracted, is a client of a PR firm of Guard Communications, has an office in downtown Portland, and there's a group of, of us there who are getting ready to start a campaign against this coal, or this PR company, because we don't want them supporting coal. So if this happens in your town, it's a great way, it's like, so secondary targeting, campaign targeting, is to not only go after, you know, the politician or the coal company, because they often are quite hard to get to, but who else in your community is supporting them? Um, you know, is there a PR company? Is there someone who's, you know, who's their law, law firm in the in the area? You know, who's their spokesperson who's, you know, telling the people of Spokane that this is all going to be okay? We can go after them too and say, you're in our community. We don't want coal in our community. You have to make a choice. Um, so that's something that's pretty exciting that's coming out of Portland in the next coming weeks is us going after all of the different companies who are in some way uh, providing pillars of support for these coal companies in the Northwest. Um, and, and yeah, and we can, I actually, we maybe think that, you know, Amber is, uh, Amber Energy is potentially quite weak right now. They were, they're an Australian company. They have two terminal proposals. They have Longview and the barging proposal. And uh, holds Amber and Arch Coal and Longview. Um, and a few weeks ago, we were expecting them to go public with their IPO to become a public, tr to become to join the stock market basically and be a publicly traded company. Uh, and they didn't, and they delayed it for an indefinite amount of time, which means that they either got a ton of more investment, or their books aren't that great, and they're actually weaker than we think. So these are some things that we can sort of draw on as strengths that they don't want to show us their books, um, and we have to hope that that's because we're doing a good job, that we need to keep focusing on shutting them down, removing their pillars of support so that when they look for investors, the investors will look uh, at the Northwest um, as a 
risky place to put energy. Um, so that's sort of the update that I've got. Uh, and I'm really excited for this uh, coal export action. I think keeping it in the ground is the best, easiest thing for all of us uh, because it's when it comes down to it, we're not just fighting coal exports out of Northwest. Uh, we need to make sure that we win here, but that we do so much, we inflict so much financial damage on the companies uh, that they don't just go to the Gulf Coast or Baja or you know, the East Coast or continue uh, or expand in BC. We, I think, are extremely unique in the Northwest that we have so much energy around um, what we want our communities and our futures to look like and how we want to protect our environment, that we can start by blocking coal exports here, but it is very important that we do such a good job of it that we prevent the companies from creeping into other places around uh, North America that perhaps don't have as uh, resilient and strong of a network that we're sitting here um, with right now. So. Um, that's what I've got, and I'd be happy to talk with folks more um, about sort of the things that the NGO world is doing, uh, or things that the NGO world can't do, <laughs> which is more than we'll do tomorrow. <laughs> Can I add one last thing? Um, Helena, Missoula, and Billings have already passed resolutions mm -hmm. asking for, calling for a programmatic EIS, and scoping hearings in each of those towns. Uh, because of the rail, railroad uh, yeah. impacts. Mm -hmm. um, and then also on the topic of whether or not if they can cover the coal cars, they can't because it's a fire hazard is what all the, the research that I've done. They can't cover them because coal spontaneously combusts and it's a fire hazard if they do. Um, right. And, uh, yeah. and they, they say that they'll spray this surfactant, which is um, even more problematic because they want to put a chemical on top of a toxic substance uh, and then burn it later and assume that we're not going to notice that they just made something toxic even more toxic. And there's uh, no study on how weather affects that right. surf surfactant. Mm -hmm. so. In fact, BNSF just wrote a letter last week to Governor Gregoire uh, sort of trying to quelch some of the concerns that uh, we've been raising around the health uh, and safety of the coal trains. And they actually said, um, you know, when it comes to when it comes to covering, like, applying these chemicals and the coal dust issues and things, um, essentially, to sum it up, they said, we basically trust what the coal companies will do. It's out of our hands. We've told them the things, um, but, it, but it's in their field, and we trust them. And we know better than that how to trust them. I mean, and, yeah, they, we've already been lied to. <laughs> we've already been lied to once in these export proposals. I think um, the first proposal that came in the Northwest was in Longview. And that was initially a proposal for 10 million, 10 million, tons? 10 million yeah. tons. And it wasn't until um, internal until Columbia Riverkeeper discovered yeah. some internal documents that said that their actual plans were something, um, you know, in the end, hoping for 80 million. But right now they've settled, they've refiled for 44 million. So they've already come in and lied to us once. And they've been in our, like these proposals have been out there for only a few years. So it's only a matter of time before we find out the rest of the lies. Doesn't um, the that they blow off during the trip? Excuse me? Doesn't the surfactant wear off or blow off during the trip? I would, with wind in western Mon or eastern Montana and Wyoming and rain out in western Washington and wind out in eastern Washington, and there's no way that that doesn't affect that surfactant. So, when yeah, well, the cold, when it goes through like really serious rainstorms, it gains a huge amount of weight. Oh, I'm sure, yeah. I'm sure. Well, is, is that, was that a reason? And I understand that they, they open on the bottom, but is that a reason to ask them to be covered? Is to keep more of that, that water mm -hmm. going through the coal and ending up in the ground? We don't want to ask for covered trains. We want to ask for no trains. I understand. Um, that. And they, they can't cover them, like I, like I said, because it's a fire hazard, because coals, it spontaneously combusts. And there's been actually coal trains that pull into uh, a rail yard or an a export facility that are on fire. Um, so it's, they can't cover those coal trains. How do they put them out? 
don't know. It's a good question. Pray for rain. <laughs>